OK, I'm handing the reins over now to you, our viewers, and thank you so much to all of you who have sent in your questions. Right, let's start with, let's start with Tom. Um, investment trusts clearly had a challenging year. What have you, and I say you, <laughs> <laughs> what have you all been doing about it? I mean, it's, it's undeniable. Uh, investment trusts, uh, which is a particular structure around some of the positions that, that we hold, have faced a really challenging time for the last sort of 12, uh, 14 months or so. Mm. Um, I won't go into the technicalities of it because it's quite boring. <laughs> Very interesting to me, but, but, but quite boring. But they have. Um, the fundamental is, uh, element is that the assets themselves remain really high quality. Yeah. So things like renewable energy, that can, in fact, have continued to go from strength to strength. Uh, we've got a position in um, infrastructure that has continued to increase in value. Mm. But the problem with investment trusts uh, and the challenge, I probably better to say, is that you have the actual value of the instrument, of the, of the underlying portfolio, mm -hmm. and then you have what the market is pricing it at. Okay. And what we've seen with investment trusts across the board over the last uh, year has been that the market has priced down the value or the share price mm -hmm. of those investment trusts, mm -hmm. despite the fact that the net asset values, the value of the actual underlying instrument, the positions, remains really solid. So we continue to believe in the investment trusts. We are very cognizant of the fact that the market has priced them down. Um, and what we are anticipating is a number of things. Well, what we've seen on one is that predators come in and actually just buy them out. Um, we saw that on, on one of the positions where the, the share price moved 60% upwards in one day uh, when they were bought out. Uh, this was Roundhill when they were bought out. Um, so that's one thing that could happen. You sometimes have investment trusts that where the underlying management will then actively try to bring that share price back up by buying back their own shares, reorganising the balance sheet uh, on their book. Um, or then just the backdrop changes. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've seen over the last month, actually. So on a number, in fact, pretty much across the board on the investment trusts that we hold, we saw a movement in November of anything from sort of 5% to about 30% upwards, okay. yeah. where the market started to adjust. Um, so it's been a challenging time, but we continue to really actually believe strongly in the underlying assets. Okay, one for you, James. How influenced are you by the negative headlines when it comes to portfolio decisions? The negative headlines? Mm. Uh, oh, uh, oh, not at all. Uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, we, there are, we are actioning client requests to, to take some money out of their portfolio or investing in new portfolios. Mm -hmm. So obviously in making those decisions, we're making a lot of careful decisions about how to place those orders. And in those cases, we're looking at what the market is doing and in that particular instrument, um, but not the headlines there. Yeah. I, just, I think headlines feed in to wider um, considerations, which, you know, as part of the investment analysts would be looking at through the research. But I think it's safe to say, Tom, not on a daily basis. That's, mm -hmm. that's on a long, you're looking at the longer time frames there. Absolutely. I mean, the markets, be it equities, bonds, investment trusts, all of those, they are a forward pricing mechanism. They are yeah. pricing in future expectations. Mm. So the noise today we yeah. have to look through. Yeah. It's, it's, it's impossible to avoid it and to ignore it, yeah. but really it's about trying to decide on the direction of travel mm. and how we can expect the economy and the backdrop, and importantly the markets, to move and to shape and change over yeah. a medium term. Yeah. To longer I guess headlines can be very sort of misleading sometimes, can't they? They yeah. can be sort of screaming at you, and it's what's behind them that's often the nuanced, a bit more nuanced. No, <laughs> absolutely. With the geopolitical noise that we have in the background, it would be easy to draw a conclusion that you would just sell everything, yeah. <laughs> go to cash, and that's it. Okay, um, Tom, uh, AI is the buzzword at the minute, but is that all it is? Is it all hype? I mean, I'm sure we've all got a, a, a view on that. Mm. I mean, I think from an investment standpoint, uh, clearly it was a major driver for returns earlier in the year. And, and I think it would be safe to say, certainly you know, from what we have seen, and we've done quite a lot of work on this, um, it is a huge leap forward, particularly on the generative AI, yeah. a huge leap forward in terms of the potential. But the way we're interpreting it from an investment standpoint is it's really about the productivity gains rather than necessarily any one single winner. 
clearly I, t I spoke earlier about the Magnificent Seven and you know, the likes of, of NVIDIA, really strong sort of beneficiaries of this sort of early phase in uh, generative AI, but also likes of Microsoft, who have really been driving areas. That will settle down. I think it's about the potential for productivity gains across industries mm -hmm. uh, where there are some benefits. Okay, right, let's get another question. Um, uh, David, I am thinking about getting a wealth plan. This one's for you. But may or may not sell my business in the next couple of years. So should I wait until after I've made that decision and then do a wealth plan? What do you think? Well, I think the short answer is, is no. Uh, the, I think the whole point of a wealth plan is it's not a set in stone sort of fire and forget kind of, kind of thing. So it can certainly take into account... And, and does take into account future changes in your circumstances, mm -hmm. future changes in the, in the environment. Uh, certainly, um, our client could do a wealth plan perhaps with and without and, and almost look at what the, the, the different consequences uh, might be. But yeah, I, I would suggest doing one uh, sooner rather than later okay. because uh, one of the things, uh, as we've mentioned earlier, that a wealth plan can, can do is give some level of comfort when what we've just been talking about, when the, the headlines are bad and... Uh, you know, it seems like, you know, you just want to sell everything and hide under the bed. <laughs> uh, Live under the sea. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> a wealth plan, you know, we build in uh, to our wealth plans uh, negative scenarios, prolonged uh, market, yeah. uh, you know, dislocations, etc., yeah. etc. So I would encourage, uh, you know, really sooner or rather later. You don't have to have all the answers, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to do a wealth plan. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. Okay. Next question is for Tom. Uh, what are you doing to maintain clients' wealth as the value of the US dollar declines significantly? So obviously that's predicated around a view that the dollar is going to weaken. I think the answer to that, and I think probably James can chip in as well, is that it does depend on your base currency. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that the way in which we invest is globally uh, for all portfolios. We have a global view. Um, and I'll try to avoid getting too technical about the hedging and the way in which we approach it, but we think about the assets that we have in two different ways. So when it comes to our equity exposure, we tend to actually embrace foreign uh, exchange exposure. So that is part and parcel of the way in which those investments will play out over time. Mm -hmm. When it comes to things like fixed income, or what we describe as nominal assets, which generate a positive uh, you know, a, a, a return in terms of income, we do tend to hedge those positions. But the level of hedging, and when I talk about hedging, I mean protecting against foreign ex exchange okay. exposure yep. versus your base currency. Sure. So the key question there is, what is your base currency? Okay. So if you have a starting currency that is dollar, then actually it's having you know, foreign currency within your portfolio, if you have a weakening in, in dollar, will be beneficial. We run the portfolios in sterling dollars and euros and yeah. we hedge those, those different currencies accordingly. If, the, if we also became of the very strong view that there was uh, likely that the dollar could weaken, having the hedging uh, separate in the portfolio to the actual assets also gives us the opportunity to take a view on that. So we have that opportunity to, to do that. Mm. Most of the time we don't do that unless it looks like a really surefire um, scenario. Okay. I, think, I think the only thing I would add is if you don't know what your base currency is, mm -hmm. uh, it tends to be the currency where you're spe you know, spending yeah. most of your uh, spending most. So mm -hmm. uh, many clients have more than one base currency, so they may have a home in the UK and perhaps a home in the US. Uh, so, and, and we can cater for that as well, but just to, just to kind of clarify, base currency okay. is really where you do use the, the majority of the spending. Tom, what impact do you think the elections next year are going to have? I think we alluded recently there was 42 or something happening, but yeah, I'd yeah. imagine a lot of people will be thinking about US, UK. Yeah, so, I mean, there are a number of different scenarios. I think the main ones that you'd look to would be UK to a, to a lesser extent, to be fair. We are global investors, but it can create noise. It can create some volatility in markets. I think the main ones will come out of the likes of, of well, India to a lesser extent, but it's, it's an important one. Yeah. Uh, but the likes of US, yeah. where, which it does dominate uh, the narrative. Mm -hmm. Typically speaking, a Republican uh, party are seen as sort of pro-market. Democrats are not necessarily anti, but Republicans are sort of seen pro-capitalism. Um, so it can have some impact on expectations. Mm -hmm. But it's around trying to read through that sure. noise. David, um, somebody here has said, I have no idea when to retire. 
I think a lot of people feel like yeah. this. I love working and would a wealth plan help me to decide at what age I could retire at, at least from a financial point of view? Uh, well, it certainly would help, yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, you know, as uh, we, we um, in our wealth plans, we assume uh, that people live to age 100, right? Uh, which is probably uh, a little bit uh, generous, at least for a middle-aged Scotsman like me. However, um, what it does show is perhaps when you might uh, run out of money if, mm -hmm. you, if you didn't uh, in invest or if you spend too much. So it certainly can, can help. But it's, uh, I mean, I think retirement is much more than a financial decision. So yeah, yeah, I get, I get, yeah. the, I get the, the point. So yes, certainly financially you could say, well, yes, I've got enough to live on, provided things don't change. But things do change. And as I said in the earlier answer, you know, things might change in, in your circumstances, they might change in the sort of geopolitical mm -hmm. circumstances mm -hmm. as, as we talked about, whether you know, different governments might tax differently, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it certainly wouldn't hurt. And I, I really would, you can probably tell, encourage people yeah, <laughs> yeah, to, do, <laughs> to do a wealth yeah. plan uh, sure. as soon as possible. Okay, right, last question. It's going to you, James. What kind of performance are you seeing from sustainable portfolios? Oh, yeah, interesting. So uh, our sustainable portfolios have been performing really well. So we launched these just, just over a year and a half ago, um, and the returns have been very good. They, the returns, and what I mean by that is, we expect our sustainable portfolios to have a similar return to our responsible portfolios over the long term. They have all the benefits of the same uh, asset allocation process and robust process that our responsible portfolios have and um, the same target returns. Over the long term, the return should be the same. In the short term, because they hold different assets, mm. we do expect the returns to be a bit different. Sure. So, you know, one might be a little bit ahead now and in six months, the other one might be a little bit ahead if, if, if mm. it was a race, but it isn't. The thing that makes me pleased about the way the returns have panned out is they're very similar because the more similar they are, the, sort of in, the better because that's, we expect them to have the similar return, the same or similar return over the long term. The real reason to choose a sustainable portfolio versus a responsible portfolio is uh, a not performance related. It would be around, uh, it's the reason, the, the only reason really is because you want to think about the impact your investments are having on the world around you. Yeah, absolutely. Look, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge. It's been really interesting, but I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Thank you to all of our guests today and thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.